Pastor Wilson will be lecturing tonight on the substance of things hoped for. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Pastor Doug Wilson. Let's pray together. Father, we give this time to you. I pray that you, you would use it. We surrender to you. I pray your word would work into, would be worked into our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So when uh, Jeff was talking about uh, the amazing giftedness of Dr. Bonson uh, and all the different, he was, he was a 50-pound brain and just amazing, multi-talented. I thought of a similar person in church history, um, and that was Charles Spurgeon, who was amazingly gifted across so many. In fact, he was so gifted that God knew that we would be tempted to idolize him. So he made him a Baptist. <laughs> I don't know what made me think of that. <laughs> All right, so this is, I was thinking over here that this is not really a conference. This is more like a post-millennial dog pile. <laughs> One thing after another. And uh, this were professor, professional wrestling. I'm the big guy with the red bandana at the very last that comes off the top ropes, and I feel sorry for you. <laughs> so, post-millennial eschatology is not just that branch of theology that talks, about, that talks about when all the roses bloom. It is far more than that. Post-mill eschatology is itself the rose of all theology. It is the rose of all true theology in full bloom. All right, this is where everything comes together. It's what ties everything together. Or put another way, an optimistic eschatology is not when a bunch of theologians gather at a conference and exchange learned papers on the value of June. No, biblical eschatology is June. We're not pointing at something. It it is the thing itself. Now, this kind of thing, for a post-millennialist to say, this is the bloom of all theology. It can, seem, it can be said in a way that seems doctrinally uh, self-serving, right? Like that time when two ministers from different denominations were talking, and one of them wrapped up the conversation amicably enough by saying, well, we both serve the Lord, you in your way, and I in his. <laughs> so, of course, everybody, we all define what we think from where we are, right? What, what we think. So, but we need to stay far away from that kind of serene and unself-aware conceit. But let us also stay far away from the faux humility that doesn't ever want to maintain anything in particular. And whenever a disagreement threatens to break out, rushes in to say, we're all saying the same thing, really. Because we're not, right? A, a liberal is someone who won't take up his own side in an argument. Just as Philip Schaff once said that the greatest triumph of the medieval church was the Reformation. So also Warfield once said that pure and undefiled religion was simply Calvinism. Quote, for Calvinism is just religion in its purity. We have only, therefore, to conceive of religion in its purity, and that is Calvinism. Now that sounds, to modern ears, like a bigoted statement, right? Right? However abrasive to modern ears this kind of thing sounds, because the spirit of obligatory moderation is an attitude that won't take up its own side in an argument, and hence is incipient liberalism, it is never, there is nevertheless a gracious Christian way to maintain such things without turning into a bigot. To believe that proposition X is true is the same thing as thinking that not X isn't. Should I go over that again? <laughs> If heads is up, then tails is down. If heads is up, then tails is down. And to think something in definite and particular terms is synonymous with thinking at all. Uh, G.K. Chesterton once said that an open mind is like an open mouth. It's meant to close on something. You're not supposed to go through the world catching flies. You're, you're, You're supposed to close on something. You have an open mind in order to evaluate, study, weigh, sift, and then decide. So, to think something in definite and particular terms is synonymous with thinking, just thinking. Unless you think something, you're not thinking. Unless you think something, you're not thinking. 
Now, let me illustrate this, and you perhaps you've had encounters like this, and perhaps you should run scenarios like this in your head and not out loud. <laughs> and if you, well, maybe not even then, but um, suppose someone comes, let's say you want to preach, you, you, you don't want to preach uh, in a, it seems to me kind of way, or on the other hand, and at the end of the day, you, know, you want to get up and, and announce the word of God, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. God wrote a book. And you speak as though, uh, you speak with authority and not as the scribes. And then, inevitably, if you're tr trying to have that kind of ministry, someone's going to come to you and say, uh, Brother so and so, or Pastor so and so, or, you know. You, the, your problem with your preaching is that you're so cocksure you're right. You just, you're right all the time. You just, uh... Now, Question, did they come to you because they thought they were wrong? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, they're, they are as confident as you are, yeah. right? Just about something different. It, 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 um, you, can't, you can't think unless you've decided, okay? Now, so what we've done in our era is we have blurred and obscured that process. Some people get privileged treatment. We never... We act like they didn't decide every, anything, and we allow them to say the most outrageous things because it sounds humble, all right? And yet someone who says, I want to declare to you the truth that God revealed in a book, and this would have been true had I never been born, and if my feelings weren't anywhere near here. This is true. This is God's truth. That is seen as arrogant. And if someone... If another pastor gets up and says, you know, it seems to me, and on the other hand, and I was working through this, and I call them fern pacer, pacer preachers. There's a fern over here and a fern over here, and they pace between the ferns. And they agonize, and they say, and it's all, and, and you go away thinking, they were so approachable, so transparent. They're so humble. How do you know they were so humble? They talked about him, he talked about himself all the time. <laughs> so someone who thinks, Glory be to God the Father. You know, I'm irrelevant. I'm just a messenger. He's arrogant. And the person who talks about himself all the time is humble. And Isaiah says in Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute light for darkness, darkness for light, sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet. So, I want to preface my comments on postmillennialism with a few other. That's my first introductory statement. The second one is this. This is a matter of faith and unbelief. This is a matter of faith and unbelief. So, having said all these things, I want to add an important qualification. Even though this is November, a month in which I've de dedicated myself to being thought unreasonable, <laughs> I am out of my home state, and I'm, at a, I'm a guest at somebody else's conference, and so I thought should, I should unbend just a little and qualify a little thing. To state baldly that postmillennialism should be thought of as the culmination of all that is good in Reformed theology is shooting the moon, is it not? As I hope you will see in a, few min in a few moments, the exegetical groundwork is firm. The footings are poured, and I believe they will support the building. So why then are eschatological issues so vexed and troubled in our time? The answer is one that I take from the toolbox of presuppositionalism, which is was touched on earlier in this conference. Van Til, Van Til would tell us, were he here, there is no such thing as a raw fact, as an uninterpreted fact. There's no such thing as raw data. And in the same way, there is no such thing as raw exegesis. There's no such thing as raw exegesis sitting there on the table. The message of the Bible is always to be apprehended and taken in by faith. That's how you chew. That's how your mouth closes. Okay? What Jesus said on the Emmaus Road that was touched on in Jeff's talk, what Jesus said on the Emmaus Road is pertinent here. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's Luke 24, 25. Jesus was speaking here to two of his disciples, to two who loved him, and who were no doubt better Christians than I am. But it is still possible for dedicated followers of Christ to struggle with believing, quote, all that the prophets have spoken. That is a hard 
hurdle for a lot of Christians. And just a few verses down from that encounter, Jesus appeared to his apostles and opened up their understanding of the prophets. That's down in verse 45. Like the grace of the post-millennial fulfillment, understanding the nature of the stupendous promises is also a grace, a gift. And grace is always to be received by faith and by faith alone. And so faith alone is the framework upon which all of this rests. I'm going to lay out the exegesis. I'm going to lay out what I believe the Bible clearly states. But you're not going to be able to pick it up. It has no handles unless you have faith. That's the only way to pick it up. Now, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, the, the prophets pointed again and again to the resurrection of the Messiah. But it wasn't until Jesus was standing there in the upper room with them that it says they believed not for joy, right? And he invites Thomas to touch him, and, and he's right there. The promises of this post-millennial eschatological fulfillment is, is God's not going to deal with us in the same way. There's not a risen Lord who will appear here with us and prove an eschatological position correct. So how, how will it be done then? How is faith brought about? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God has to be applied by the spirit. If there's a movement of the spirit, then people will see, taste, and understand. If not, then not. So, an autobiographical excursus. In just a minute, I'm going to share with you some of the things I see in the text. But first, I want to tell you how I came to see them. When I fell down the reformational stairs, hitting my head on every step, <laughs> the, very, the very first paradigm shift I went through was postmillennialism. That was the very first one. First that, then about three years later, in 1988, Calvinism. So yes, if you do the math, you can see that I was a post-millennial evangelical Arminian Baptist for, <laughs> for, for a few years. Pretty lonely. <laughs> I, I think I must have been the only one. A couple years later, probably, Presbyterianism came in on matters of polity, church government, and then in 1993, I became a paedo Baptist. I was making quite a clatter going down those stairs, but things have been pretty stable for the last 30 years or so. Now, the reason I tell you all this, I've gone through, I've gone through many paradigm shifts. I've gone through a number of doctrinal transformations. But I tell you all this so that you will recognize that when it first came time to repaint my Baptist Arminian house, right, almost 40 years ago now, the first base coat was post-millennialism. And I will never forget how the house looked after that first coat. It was, everything was just transformed. Now that first paradigm shift, how did it happen? Sometime before, I had jettisoned as non-exegetical the generic premill assumptions of modern evangelicalism. It was the kind of eschatology I had picked up just through loving Jesus in North America. Right? If you're a Christian in North America, it, it's just in the air. Right? Uh, my dad had been converted at the Naval Academy, and someone had gotten him a Schofield Bible, and he was um, not Reformed and Baptistic to the end of his life, but he, he read his Schofield Bible, and he couldn't, he couldn't see a connection between the notes and what that was in the, the text above, and so finally he just gave it away and walked away. So I, never, I was never formally dispensational. I was never in the dispensational tight groove, but... I was dispensational generically because I was a North, North, in North America. I then spent a short stint in Ladd's historic pre-mill world, but soon dropped that because I didn't see it arising out of the text either. So in the early 80s, there were a few years where I was an agnostic millennialist. I would say things, and I was already a pastor by this time, I would say things like, Jesus is coming back sometime and don't push me. But I continued reading my Bible, and different verses would taunt me, making faces at me. <laughs> this would happen particularly in the Psalms and in Isaiah, as was touched on earlier today, and provoked bum-fuzzled marginalia, marginalia from me. I'd write in the margin. Post mill? Question mark? What? <laughs> in that condition, I was, I was in this floaty condition, 
I picked up a post-millennial book, and to be frank, the hermeneutic it contained was a bit gaudy for my taste. It was uh, Paradise Restored by David Chilton. Still is a bit gaudy for me, but I remain forever grateful. So there I was, going along, muttering. At one point, he quoted 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Christ, quote, must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Christ is at the right hand of the Father now, reigning now, and he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And it also says that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. But in the generic pre-mill, in every pre-mill system that I know of, the first enemy to be destroyed is death. All right, everything goes along the same way it always has, getting bad to worse, and then Jesus comes, and the dead are raised, and the first enemy to be destroyed is death. But Paul says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. He must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Now, when I read that verse in the book, not, I wasn't reading in the, in the text, I read it in the book, Christ must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And when I read that, something snapped in my head, and an entire post-millennial world, worldview began to assemble, like one of those Transformer thingies in a CGI movie. Now, <laughs> it was, whoa. Uh, this is sort of Presbyterian LSD. <laughs> Out of, all the pres- all, out of all the paradigm shifts I mentioned earlier, this one was by far and away the most fun. Some of the others were no fun at all. So this was exhilarating, to put it mildly. It was just exhilarating. I am an evangelical, the son of evangelicals of the tribe of Benjamin. And what I'm doing here is I'm giving you my testimony. This is how I've come to see what I believe Abraham saw. All right? The substance of things hoped for. What did Abraham see? What did Abraham see? I would like to begin by weaving a few passages together. Passages that talk about faith and about Abraham and about our inheritance of the world. There's a lot going on here, so it will be a tight weave. Please bear with me. But having laid down that pattern and handed it to you, I would use up the remainder of my talk, if I have time, to expand on the kindness of God extended to our sorry planet and the glory of the Great Commission. So the title of my talk is taken from Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me read that again. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not simply a demeanor of nebulous trust in whatever. Faith is not getting yourself into a faithy frame of mind such that you radiate vague trust vibes <laughs> like heat from a wood stove. Faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. But the fact that they're not seen does not mean that they were not promised and does not mean that the promise was not specific and understandable. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And this is not an exercise in wish fulfillment, whatever those, whatever those wishes might be. The things hoped for were the things promised. So just a couple of quick uh, parenthetical comments. You remember those old early experiments in flight when um, inventors would build themselves a set of Batman wings, you know, and they jump, jump off the barn or something. Um, how much faith did that guy have in his Batman wings? Lots of faith. Did he fly? No. <laughs> Apparently, faith has nothing to do with whether you can fly. <laughs> right? And then suppose you've got a grandma whose grandkids are on the other side of the country, and she's, le- and she's never flown before in her life. Never. And she's terrified of airplanes. And finally, they lure her onto an airplane with pictures of her grandkids. <laughs> I should tell you, it's, uh, my father-in-law was an Air Force pilot for 23 years, and he had, his mother was in that position. Was, and he was giving her a tour of, the, of his, he was, flew all the bees, the, his, um, his bomber. And he, he was give, giving, here, try this seat out, and here, try this. And they hit the seat belt, and then he said, hit it, boys. <laughs> they took <laughs> Uh, oh, but I digress. 
This, can, this, can this grandma have the shakes all the way to the time that you know, she's terrible, every little bump? But what's, what's the difference between her and the Batman guy? She's flying, and he doesn't, right? Faith has to do with the faithfulness of the object, right? What happens has to do with the faithfulness of the object, not how you, Christ is the one who does all the work. Christ is the one who does it. Our faith doesn't do it. All of you have faith that the roof is going to stay up, but your faith is not keeping the roof up. You have faith that your chair is going to hold you, but your, your faith is not holding you. The chair is holding you. All right, so when we trust in the promises of God, the promises of God are the things that are faithful. That's the thing that does the work. All right? The other parenthetical comment is this. When Abraham uh, sacrificed Isaac and came to the point of sacrifice, and God intervened at the last moment, as Jeff, uh, referred, to, Jeff referred to that story, when Abraham came to that last moment, what was going on? God was not testing Abraham's love. He was not testing his love. It wasn't, Abraham, do you love me to part uh, enough to part with your son? Do you, who do you love more, me or your son? It wasn't a test of his love. It was a test of his faith. Because God had told Abraham, through Isaac, your seed will be reckoned. Through Isaac. Right? And Hebrews tells us that Abraham was expecting a resurrection. Abraham was expecting to kill his son and then have his son raised. That's what he was expecting. And he travels with the servants at the bottom of the hill. They leave the servants at the bottom of the hill. Abraham says to the servants, we are going to go up and worship. And then he says, and we will return to you. All right? That's his faith. All right? It's his faith. It's his faith in God's promise. That's what's going on. Also, incidentally, he traveled three days to get to the location where he offered Isaac up. And God told him specifically to go to the region of Moriah in order to do this. The region of Moriah is where Jesus was crucified thousands of years later. So, when Hebrews 11, I started Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, substance of things hoped for, the, the evidence of things not seen. When Hebrews 11 gets to Abraham just a few verses down from our text, what is said there is striking, really striking. This is verses 8 through 10. So the, remember, Hebrews 11 is God's hall of faith, and a number of different people are mentioned, and Abraham is one of them. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he, sojour he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city, and this is the key, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's what Abraham saw. He was looking for a city. Now, the Gnostic undertow in our time is a strong one, and it is the easiest thing in the world here to imagine that Abraham was thinking about going to heaven when he died. Just, okay, looking for a city up in heaven. But that is not what this is talking about at all. When Abraham was looking for a city, he was, he was looking forward in history. He was looking forward in time, in history, toward what was promised, the substance of things hoped for. Remember? What had God promised him? What had God promised him? This is Genesis 12, 3. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's the promise. That's what Abraham was looking for. That's the city he's looking for. Right? He's not looking for pie in the sky. He's not, looking for the, he's not looking toward the afterlife. This is not to disparage the afterlife. This is not to disparage the idea of going to heaven when we die. We believe that too. But that's not what these passages are talking about. Abraham believed God when God said, through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. God had promised him that all the families in the world, that all the nations on earth would be blessed and would be blessed through him. The Chinese, the Canadians, the Germans, the Congolese, Zulu, Dutch, 
Argentinians, right? you name it. You, there, there's not one square foot on this world where you can go and find a person that this, this promise doesn't encompass. Not only so, but in Galatians, Paul calls this promise the quote-unquote, the blessing of the world, excuse me, Paul calls this promise of blessing the world through Abraham, the gospel. He calls it the gospel. God preached the post-millennial vision to Abraham, and Paul says that this promise of universal blessing was the gospel. Lest you think I'm padding my argument surreptitiously, trying to sneak something in, let me quote him directly. Galatians 3, 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that is the Gentiles, God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So God says to Abraham, in you, all the nations will be blessed. That's gospel. Okay? If you're talking with a friend and he says, what is the gospel? What do you think the gospel is? And you say, the blessing of the nations through Abraham. <laughs> Do you, does your, friend, do you, your friend's eyes get squinty? <laughs> now, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is Christ died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. That is, that's the, uh, the gospel in its soteriological purity. It's how individuals are saved. That's, that is the gospel. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are gospels. Right? The message of the kingdom, when Jesus first arrived preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom... He wasn't talking explicitly, as clearly as Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15 about his own death, although Jesus does talk about it through, to his disciples through the course of the ministry. He prophesies that he's going to be executed. That's a piece of it. But the gospel is, the, that word gospel applies to a lot of things. And one of the things it applies to is the, the glory of a, uh, the glory of salvation coming to this sorry planet. God promised the world to Abraham. And Abraham believed what was promised. God promised the world to Abraham, and Abraham bought it. He said, yes. It was not just the way he believed that was credited to him as righteousness. Right? It's not just the way he believed, although it was that also. It was that he believed, what he believed, that was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, it was not just the way he believed, it was not just the adverb, it was the direct object. It was what he believed. And then this is one of my favorite verses in all scripture, Romans 4, 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Let me read that again. For the promise... Paul talks about the promise a lot, right? The promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed. Who are Abraham's seed? You and I. All right, the promise. So that means the promise that he would be heir of the world was a promise that was to Abraham and to Abraham's seed, right? And it's not top-down politics. It's not, politi it's not politically done. It's not through the law. All right? And it's not through legalism, it's not through striving, but it's through gospel preaching, through the righteousness of faith. It's through evangelism. That's how it happens. Given all this, it should not be surprising that Jesus commends Abraham for seeing so far. Jesus says in John eight fifty six, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham knew what was coming. Abraham was not in the dark about what was coming. Abraham believed what God told him. And that was that he was going to be the father of the world. Abraham's joy was not the result of seeing Abraham's bosom in Sheol or Hades. Neither was Abraham's joy grounded in an upper story afterlife, although there is such an afterlife. If, if we die, we go to be with the Lord, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. There is an afterlife. But that's not the final culminating glory. The promise was that he would be the heir of the world. That's the promise. If words have meaning, that's the promise. All right? And it was a promise that he believed. 
if we would be strengthened in our status as Abraham's children, as Abraham's seed, Abraham's children should believe it also. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Thus they silenced the foe and the avenger. If we count ourselves among them, we would do well to expect expect myriads of multitudes more. How many? How many people are going to be saved? How many people are saved? Well, God points Abraham to the stars, right? Then we come up with the Hubble telescope and then the Webb telescope, and we're starting to suspect that there are as many galaxies as we used to think there were stars. It's it's getting ridiculous. (laughs) God kind of shows off, if you know what I mean. But this has this. There's there's something important here. When John the Revelator heard the symbolic number of the elect, it was 144,000, tribe after tribe, 12,000 from each tribe. That's in Revelation 7:4. But how many were there exactly? He heard the number. 144,000. He heard, he heard, he heard. It's all counted out. But then he turned and looked. Revelation 7 9. 7 4, he hears the number. He turns and looks. And what did he see? He saw a great multitude which no man could number. How many sons of Abraham and how many daughters of Sarah will be saved in the end? The scriptural answer is that we can't count that high. God so loved the world. So, I I believe that there is such a thing as damnation. I believe there is such a thing as people being eternally lost. But I believe that the world is being saved. The world is being saved. We have no right to invert the terms. What do I mean by that? We have no authority from Christ or from his spirit to turn everything upside down or inside out to suit, us, to suit our own pet theologies. We have no right to invert all the terms. We have no right to substitute one thing for another, emptying the promises of their sweetness and glory. The fact that we do this so readily and so easily and without being challenged on it is an indication of just how much an otherworldly spirituality has crept into the entire church. Christ tells us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. There is no word that told us to pray for thy kingdom to go. Matthew 6.10. We pray for thy kingdom to come, not for us to go. The word does not say, Blessed are the meek, for they shall go to heaven when they die. No. Matthew 5.5, they are going to inherit the earth. That's this. Not that. We are not told that Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that despite his good faith attempts, the world will will succeed in getting condemned by him anyhow. (laughs) John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What do most evangelicals believe Jesus will do at the end? Condemn the world. But God did not send his son into the world to do that. He came to do the other thing, to do the saving thing. We are not told that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth, as might happen with a heavy dew on a parking lot. Habakkuk 2.14, no, it's the glory of the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How much knowledge of the glory of God will there be on this planet? How wet is the Pacific? That's the, that's the answer. Among many glorious titles that crown our Lord Jesus, the ostensible Savior of the world is not among them. 1 John 4, 14. No, he's the Savior of the world, not the ostensible Savior of the world. We are not instructed to think that while the Lord Jesus did in fact bind the strong man, somehow during the night the strong man got away. <laughs> Mark three twenty seven. The word does not say that Christ will be seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are put under his feet, which is why he will always remain there. 
There is no second coming because the enemies will never be put under. No. This is the issue. We should be like those who dream. Am I trying to weave a spell? Well, perhaps I am. But if I may, I would like to repurpose a quote from C.S. Lewis, which seems to me to be exactly on point here, even though some might think that there is a contradiction between my argument here and his larger point in that essay. But there's no contradiction, and his illustration remains. Quote, Do you think that I'm trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am. But remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have a need, you and I have need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness, which has been laid upon us for nearly a hundred years. We have had a, we've had an enchantment laid on us, a dualistic enchantment. And we've d- divided everything. There's an upper story where all the Jesus things happen. Right? Jesus and the holy angels and the Holy Spirit, they're all up there. And then there's Jesus in my heart. But the, the world belongs to the devil. Who's the God of this world? Well, most Christians would say the devil. But he's not. He's not. Amen. Jesus bound the strong man. Why? So that he could pillage his goods. Right? Uh, when the devil offered him all the kingdoms of this world, he was offering Jesus those kingdoms on the cheap. You don't have to suffer and bleed and die. I'll just give them to you. All you have to do is bow down to me. And Jesus said no, not because he didn't want the kingdoms, but because he didn't want them as a gift from the devil. Just like Abraham didn't want to, anybody to say, that he didn't want the king of Sodom to be able to say, the king of Sodom has made Abraham rich. He refused that. No, I'm not going to take that. Because, I'm not going to take them as a gift from you because I'm going to take them as pillage. I'm going to take them from you. I'm going to bind you. And, I'm going, and if the rulers of this age had known, known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? They wouldn't have done that. But they did it because they thought they had him. They thought they had him. The, the great Herbert Schlossberg, who wrote the book Idols for Destruction, said the Bible can be interpreted as a string of God's triumphs cleverly disguised as disasters. One triumph after another. What was, the, what was the greatest triumph for the kingdom of God in the history of the world? The cross. What was the worst thing that ever happened in the kingdom of the cross? All right, the disciples are disheartened. They're in the upper room. What, what are we going to do now? Everything, is, everything has come apart. All our hopes are dashed. And they were living in the moment of God's absolute conquest of the devil. And they didn't recognize it for what it was. And why? Because they were slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had had spoken. They should have been out in the garden two and a half days later saying it should be any time now. (laughs) Right? But they weren't. We are jaded in a disillusionment that we actually have no right to. We have no right to be disillusioned. Which of his promises has he not kept? When Jehovah showed the night sky to Abraham, what did Abraham have to go on if he were limited to the opinion page of the Ur of the Chaldees Gazette? And yet he believed. What did he have to go on? He's out in the middle of the nowhere, living in a tent. And Jehovah comes to him and says, "That's how, so, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed him. What makes us think that God no longer wants to leave his children gobsmacked? God loves to mess up our hair. God loves to, yeah, preach it, right? God God loves to just do the, this is not the expected thing. This is not what we would have anticipated. Um, The second person of the Trinity became a single cell in his mother's womb. The infinite God 
became a single cell in his mother's womb. Spent nine months there, was born, was suckled. Mary changed his diapers. And we think, you know, God's not very reverent. <laughs> God does. This just seems kind of not very much like a religion. Yeah. No, it's the truth, though. This is what it says in Psalm 126. When the, Lord, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, Bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, we are in the middle of clown world, right? We are in the middle of people doing and saying demented things. And we can get discouraged because this is, it's not just wicked, it's also ridiculous, right? It's not just wicked, it's stupid too. And you think, are, these people have driver's licenses. These, <laughs> they can, what are they doing? They're running. What are they doing? And we can get despondent, and we think, oh, oh. I trust you know the story, the wonderful story of Latimer and Ridley, the two uh, martyrs during uh, Bloody Mary's persecution. In Oxford, they were burned at the stake in Oxford. And Latimer, an older, an older man, older preacher, great preacher, one time he gave um, Latimer, to give you the kind of sense of the kind of man he was, Latimer was a court preacher, and he was a court preacher under Henry VIII, who was not, shall we say, a stalwart saint. And one time Latimer, a court preacher for Henry VIII, presented Henry VIII with a Bible as a present, and it was opened, it was marked to uh, Hebrews 13, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. <laughs> There's a present for the king. It was, Latimer was that kind of person. Well, Latimer and Ridley are wi wind up tied to a stake, and Latimer says to Ridley, play the man, Master Ridley. We shall today light, light such a candle, as I trust by God's grace, shall never be put out. So well, he's about to be burned to death, and he's saying to Ridley, we've got them now. <laughs> Amen. Right? Got them now. And then a modern evangelical dispensational Christian in his climate-controlled living room, in his lazy boy, <laughs> watching the evening news on a giant, giant flat-screen television, click, 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 it's more bad news out of the Middle East. Click, 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 click. And he gets up, goes into the kitchen, state-of-the-art kitchen, goes to a fridge that's four feet wide, gets a soft drink out of the, kit, uh, out of the fridge and says to his wife who's cooking dinner, honey, it's the last days. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to make it. <laughs> what? What is going on? What, what is going on? People, God's people have been in desperate straits before, right? And they, we've got them now, Latimer and Ridley. And that's the kind of faith that overcomes. That's the kind of faith that overcomes. But that's the kind of faith that is given to us by the Spirit of God, working with the Word, taking the Word and screwing the Word into our hearts and souls, we are Christians. Why do we not believe the prophets? How many times does God have to say the nations will stream to the, to the Messiah? How many? If he said it five more times, would you? No, see, this is not a, it's not a quantitative thing, right? What this is is a matter of faith and unbelief. And that means it's a matter of repenting 
And that means it's a matter of the Spirit doing the work. It's not just a, it's not just a seminar ex- exercise. Okay? So, we are Christians. Why do we not believe the prophets? Why, why is the Reformed and Evangelical Church lagging so far behind King Agrippa? King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. <laughs> well, King Agrippa's one up on us. Acts 26, 27. Jehovah God sent his son into the world, not to condemn it, but rather so that the world through him might be saved. John three seventeen. What does John the Baptist say when he points at Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the propitiation, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, you can't turn that, you can't say, well, the world here means the elect, right? And then say, and then add your little pessimistic spin on it, and the elect are like 16, 17 people tops. (laughs) No, sorry. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. As it is written, right? He's, Paul believes the prophets. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for for them that love him. Thomas Chalmers, the great 19th century Scottish Presbyterian minister, once said, regardless of, regardless of how large, your vision is too small. Regardless, you can't outthink God. You can't come up with any scenario that's going to be better than what he has in store. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. Neither has entered into the heart of post-millennial man. All right. we, so we are three-year-olds playing at the beach, paddling in the water. And, and God's promises are the Pacific Ocean again. And we don't have any grasp of how good it's going to get. All right. we, we, don't, we don't have our hearts and minds around that yet. I am convinced that we are, you, you and I, are part of the early church. School children, 500 years from now, in Christian schools, they'll all be Christian schools. So we'll just then, at 500 years, years from now, we'll just call them schools. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be studying for their history exam. And they're going to be study groups over at somebody's house in the basement. And I can't, I can never remember who lived first. Was it C.S. Lewis or Augustine? All those guys, all those guys run together. (laughs) No, I think we're part of the, I, I believe that we're part of the early church. And there's a lot of work to do. As, As Jeff concluded, there's a lot of work to do. But, as we turn our hand to the work, we understand that God is the we can plant, we can water, we can do the work, but God is the one who gives the increase. All right? God is the one who gives the increase. So we want to be faithful, we want to be found at our station, we want to be laboring diligently in the corner of the vineyard where God has assigned us, and realize that the results are God's. The results are in God's hands, and we don't get to step away from it to evaluate it. We don't have, we don't have the advantage. We don't, we don't have a high enough balcony to look down on the whole thing and see why is God, you know, why are these Christians in the Congo massacred? Why? why? You know, why did this happen over here? Why did this? We, we're servants. We're, we are uh, bit players. We're not the generals. We're, we, we don't understand. What we, what we have to understand, though, is that God has given his word, and he's given his word so that we might believe. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If we believe, then you're going to have the kind of steel in your spine that enables you to stand up against all 
the lies, all the gaslighting that's going on in our day. I mentioned earlier clown world, but I, I take a couple of principles. I take great encouragement in this principle. In the long run, stupidity doesn't work. Right? That's not a long-term strategy. <laughs> Herbert Stein, the economist, once said, and this is Stein's law, anything that cannot continue on indefinitely won't. <laughs> right? So what, when, all, when this, we're currently in the grip of a bad fever. And there is going to come a time, and I think it's fairly soon, I think probably within a couple of years, there's going to come a time when the fever breaks. And when the fever breaks, the Christians who all along through the whole thing were saying, Christ or chaos. It's Christ or chaos. And that fever dream was the chaotic stage. When the fever breaks, if that, fi if that moment finds us at our post, at our station, feeding our kids, educating our kids, doing what God has called us to do, teaching our class, working at the vocation that God's called you to, faithfully as a Christian, in your Spot. That's what God uses. That's what He calls us to. So we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to uh, uh, volunteer to take His place. But we are to submit to His decrees and His. Well, let's before you submit to His decrees, submit to His promises first. Right. Submit to His promises first, and then submit to His decrees. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. I pray that as we think about these things, as we meditate on them, that you would encourage us. I pray you'd strengthen our faith as we are looking to you and you alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.